My name is Gary Harper. I am uh, here at Rock Paper Hand Grenades. My, we're still awaiting my uh, temporary co-host. We'll we'll introduce him when he gets here. But Jim Giordano is works at. Now I got to use your card. To remember that part. Uh, Lake Shore Recovery in Francistown. Lake House Recovery. Lake House. Not, I was close. It's on the shores of the lake, but it's, it's on not. the shores of a lake. So yeah. that's all that really mattered. Yes. Yeah. And so we're talking about that. And uh, but before I get started, I wanted I wanted to share something that I thought was pretty funny. When I was uh, about eighteen, I was walking through Worcester, nineteen probably Worcester, Mass, because I worked there, and a pretty girl says, hey, you, you want to take a personality test? And if you're 19 and a pretty girl asks you anything, the answer is yes. Yes. It doesn't matter really what it is. Yes. I need help moving my garage or whatever <laughs> it is. The answer yes. is yes. yes. And uh, that's how sexist I really am. And um, anyway, so she says you want to take a personality test. So I went in and it turned out that I needed work on my becoming clear. And it was Scientology, yeah. which uh, at that age I was not a Christian. I was I was actually seeking. I knew that there had to be something out there, but I didn't know what it was, and I was not going to fall into line with what I was told and just become a Christian because everybody else did it. Because mm -hmm. I felt that was disingenuous at best. So I was willing to listen. So I went and I studied with them for a while. And then I went to, uh, uh, after I don't know how many months there, I went to a, a party for L. Ron Hubbard, who is the founder of Scientology and also a science fiction writer. And I went to the, a, a birthday party for him in Boston. And they had a giant picture of L. Ron Hubbard at the end of the hall and everybody singing him songs. And... Um, if people haven't seen this, you sh you should this should be embedded in your your historic memory. Is a videos of uh, the Hitler Youth mm -hmm. with a giant picture of Adolf Hitler at one end of the room and all of the young men going Heil Heil, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what it re it's, it's it reminded me of at the time, and I said, wow, this is not okay, and. Um, they had us fill out a birthday card to L. Ron Hubbard, and I said, you know, anytime people get together and they worship somebody like they are worshiping you, it is, it is not, it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. And I've never gone back. Okay, that was nine, so I was 19. I have been getting letters, uh, books, uh, magazines, or magazines, I shouldn't say books, magazines and, and uh, flyers from them ever since. Mm -hmm. I've changed addresses I don't know how many times. I've never contacted them, but they still f kept sending me stuff. My, my feeling was the more money they're spending on me, the less money they have to corrupt somebody else. Good and it's point. just as easy for me to throw something in the trash. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, they called today. Interesting. Which is really strange. And they said, uh, are you a member of Scientology? says, no, I am not were you I says well I studied with you you know you know 30 over 30 years ago for no, 40 years ago you're giving away your age I know Gary. it's pretty obvious anyway <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm giving away much anyway so um, I said I studied with you over 40 years ago so oh, yeah we have that that you took this course and this course is yeah and I told him what I just told you exactly mm -hmm. why I never went back and it was just it was just very funny. Mm -hmm. It was just a funny cotton picking interaction that after forty years they would bother calling to find out if they're ma make doing these mails in vain or if I was still interested in Scientology. And I said, nope. I became a Christian uh, quite a few years ago, and I I don't find any any need to be involved with you. Mm -hmm. Made it. You did. Come on. I saved the seat. Sorry to keep you waiting. No worries. And my apologies to both of you gentlemen and to your uh, faithful viewers. Faithful? Do we have As faithful viewers? I didn't know I'd like that. to think so, all three of them. As we <laughs> know, the traffic around the Manchester area can I be a know, bit brutal. I know, it's brutal. I was having a hard time it's parking. Good to, see you. good to see you again, sir. Young sir. This is Jim. It's Eric. an honor to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you as this well. This is the Thank Honorable you. Eric Eastman. 
who is uh, pretty honorable, actually. On odd number days. On odd number days. Which I hope this is. This is. It could be. I don't know. And an even numbered leap year. Oh, is it? Uh, I, oh. Last year. No, two years. No, I don't even know. Okay, all bets are off. Okay. <laughs> in, Gary and I are in the same boat, confused. Yes. So, so anyway, um, anyway, that was my phone call today from uh, Scientology uh, checking up on me. It was just, it was pretty funny. So I guess I'm probably not going to get their magazines anymore. I don't think so. No. You never no. know, though. No, you don't. But at least you were honest about your impressions. I saw what you had to share in synopsis about that about that discussion uh, on Facebook and I, I was struck by your correlation between the uh, the Hitler rallies and oh yeah it was it was wicked what it, you it was experienced. it was ex extremely obvious to me at the time but the thing is 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 the original sin as far as biblical original sin was the temptation from the devil was that if they ate from the tree of knowledge they would become like god mm -hmm. Scientology, if you follow their beliefs, you become like a god. So that's, that's, it's, it's just a different arrangement of the same lie. But anyway, that's a whole nother show, really. It sure is. It sure is. Uh, I, I, did, uh, I did a little reading up, checked out the website of, uh, of Lake House. I was deeply impressed. I saw what Mark had to say in the mm -hmm. About Us page on the website. It's an excellent website, by the way. Folks, I'm, I'm sure our guests can tell you exactly what it is. I don't have it memorized, but... but uh, LakehouseRecovery.com. Excellent. Um, but it was very heartfelt and very genuine, um, and also very mission-driven. I could, I could see that. Yes, it is very mission-driven. Uh, sure. the, the goal is to help alcoholics recover from the disease of alcoholism, which from... All intents and purposes, nobody ever recovers from because it's it's a chronic disease, and it is, um, if left untreated, it is fatal. Um, sure. The premise of the Lake House is to immerse the the clients in the twelve steps of recovery, mm -hmm. and by doing so, through the program that it's laid out, as it's laid out in the the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. And following the steps, it releases, relieves and releases the bondage that the um, that alcohol and narcotics can have, which are emotional, physical, spiritual, and once the physical part is gone, it's the it's the mental and the emotional that we deal with on uh, through the steps. Well, it's a, it's a daunting undertaking um, and a crucial resource for so many people that oftentimes don't know where to turn mm -hmm. or, or how to reach out. Yes. And I'm sure you know that and, and, and have learned how to, how to soft pedal um, the offer mm -hmm. so that people can understand that this is no judgment or, or no indictment on their, their character mm -hmm. or anything like that. It's just a recognition of a, of a chemical challenge they have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not unlike any other diagnosed disease. And if you approach it intelligently and you approach it constructively, you can beat it. I agree with you, but there is such a stigma regarding addiction that sure is. the majority of the public doesn't perceive it that way. They look at it as a moral thing where you can put that down if you want to and it's much much more than that yeah. and the entire staff at the lake house knows what that is all about and we work with families we work with the actual clients themselves to get better and through every step of the process the families are involved there's family visitations there's there's just so much happening at the facility. There's, it's just, it's hard to put into a small, encapsulated version. Right. So it's. I, I know the one thing I liked about it is there's a lot of recovery places, because like you said, that the problem is, you get the physical addiction which you can deal with in a, in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, where they physically need the alcohol or they start 
Because you, I don't know if you know. Do you know that you can actually die from withdrawing from alcohol? I didn't know that, but I, the difference I know between, it can be rough. The difference between getting off of heroin and alcohol is heroin, you wish you died, and alcohol, if you quit cold turkey, you can actually die. I didn't, actually didn't know that. I think a lot of people don't either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so getting over that, that physical, first physical hurdle is not, you know, with the right facility, you can get over that. But the problem is the spiritual, and that's what most re a lot of recovery places have avoided dealing with. Mm -hmm. Because to be politically correct, you can't mention really God. Mm -hmm. And the one help, the one thing that helps you get over that spiritual hur hurdle, is God. Mm -hmm. So the, it's it's to me a lot of them. It's almost like if you're you you know uh, somebody who's trying to recover from some disease and they said well you have to go to a the specialist and they said well I, I don't believe in that specialist oh okay well let's work around that mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah and I'm the specialist is God you know and it's and it's that that component like if you look at the 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 facilities that are actually successful in helping people get off drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. it's the it's the faith-based organizations yes the, the ones that are strictly secular I don't think are even remotely as, as effective I really don't know a lot of the statistics so I, I agree with what you're saying but I don't have any facts to back that up so I, I don't, don't we don't allow facts to interfere <laughs> with uh, what we say on the on the show. Not on this show. Oh, okay. No. As long as I'm on the same page yeah, as you we're guys. On the <laughs> all right. We're all set. Um, but I know I'm quite a few people that are in recovery, and I've seen the process of some, and I've seen others struggle where um, they just aren't open to a different perspective, such as changing in the the aspect of spirituality and the perception of spirituality. And I agree with you that um, without changing a person that comes into this type of recovery program, whether it be our facility or any other, then chances of relapse is very, very high. Right, right. Yeah, if you're in a certain set of uh, behavior patterns, if you don't do something to uh, escape from that mm -hmm. those patterns you might be able to go back to that same situation and not drink or drug for a short while but not it's not going to last long mm -hmm. that recovery is going to be pretty short because mm -hmm. we in in the recovery community there's a lot of people that end up getting detoxed 10 times mm -hmm. you know and their odds of recovery aren't really good but because they're not changing. They're not changing the mental, physical. Physical they can do, but not the mental and the emotional. And the spiritual. Per, and the spiritual person. It's the all-encompassing change. Figure, people realize the ones that bounce in and out, and I've seen quite a few people do it, that it is, I'm going to put the drink down and I'm good. And it's just like with a chocolate chip cookie. I can walk away from a package of them, but if I see one and have one, I'm going to have 18 of them. And even know how I know I'm going to feel. And I've talked to many addicts and alcoholics that are the same way, that they know that something's going to be terrible, but they're going to do it anyways because they don't have that defense. Right. Because it's all the mind that keeps running around and around, um, saying that I'm not worth it, it doesn't work, and all those things. Did you know you just, you just touched on my theory of heaven? What it's like what's that heaven is a place where you can eat chocolate chip cookies and the ratio between chocolate chip cookies and milk is always perfect perfect okay because you know like sometimes you have like too many chocolate chip cookies and not enough milk or you have too much milk and you still you don't have enough chocolate chip cookies mm-hmm yeah okay so but that's my theory. That but, explains a lot. But the question is, do the chocolate chip <laughs> cookies have enough chocolate chips in them? Oh, yeah, they perfect. You They're get perfect. some that have like one or two, and the cookies are huge. And right, yeah, that's you got to have more. Exactly. That would be a great metaphysical talk to take, take up with God, see, see what God's take on that would be. 
I mean, seeing as you're already in heaven and you're right, you're digging in. Yeah. <laughs> but that's anyway. That's my theory. Well, that totally debunks the Talking Heads song that says heaven's a place that nothing ever happens, because apparently. Oh. Uh, I. Th good talking, things do happen. Talking Heads. Okay. Yeah. Right. I don't know why that. That just flitted across my mind. Uh, I wanted to get back to, <laughs> I wanted to get back to uh, to Lake House uh, on one point you just touched on, mm -hmm. as far as the the fundamental elements of a successful recovery process. And you talked about family. Mm -hmm. You talked about the degree to which you guys integrate a person's family in their recovery process, mm -hmm. and how you regard it as being necessary. It's absolutely necessary um, to have the support of the family behind the person. The addict and alcoholic burns a lot of bridges in their disease. Sure. And through denial, it is constant with those bur bridges being burned. When somebody is willing to accept help, if the family is behind that decision a thousand percent, it makes it a lot easier instead of turning the back on the, the addict, the family turning the back, saying that they're not going to do it, it's not going to work no matter what they've done, it just it have to, the one size fits all answer doesn't cover it in every situation and this is specific sure. for the addict and alcoholic. All right, we got a phone call on Thank you for that. line something. Press the green button, see what happens. Line one. Uh, now pressing the green button. Go ahead, do it. Hello, you're on rock, paper, hand grenades. Hello, statue. Hi, Gary. Hi, how are you? I'm pretty good. I'm watching your program and I didn't get the first part. Could you tell me where the lake house is? It's in Francistown. It's on Scobie Road in Francistown, right on the shores of Haunted Lake, actually. Huh. Talk about spiritual. Yeah, very much. Quite. That could, that could <laughs> I, go either way. Okay, Gary, I didn't get that. What town is it in? It's in Francistown. Francistown. Oh, yeah. okay. Right, right next, next to, to New Boston. Boston. Where I was born. That's correct. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to say... I'm glad that they're having this. I don't know how long it's been in existence. I know his mansion is excellent. I looked through that, went all through that for um, uh, a cousin son of mine. Yeah. And anyway, um, but you know that I found too, if you have family support, uh, an in-law even, that has faith, I know of a family, if this, if this, man, he was about 40 years old, had two children and a wife, excellent family, good family, but went off the deep end with the vodka thing, and was going to really die if he had taken another drink of vodka. Um, had a spiritual friend, a friend who believed, and honestly, this person changed the mind of this young man and his family, and his family moved to Florida. They got new jobs, their children went to college, and they are doing fine. And, and it's so wonderful to see this, because I saw the whole process, because it was inv an involvement in part of my family, um, of, of this uh, uh, man who had this big, big problem and who was going to die if he you know, took any more vodka. Sandy. Uh, liver, everything was going. And um, they are living a good life. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with this younger per oh, sorry, older person. He was about seven years older who had a very good spiritual background. Not a priest, not a deacon or anything. Just seemed to get to him in the right way to explain to him um, everything. San Sandy. And what he was going to give up if he died of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. So that's all I wanted to say. But I mean, you know, this is one good case. And then Danny Duvall, I knew for a long, long time, and he turned himself around. He did very well in the high school in Manchester here. And um, there are some good, uh, and I think there are some good places. 
Up in Effingham, there's a good place, too. Effingham, New Hampshire. I know people who have gotten out of there. And I don't know if they have any spiritual background up there. His hey. mansion is excellent. See, and I Sandy. will refer to the lake house in Francistown. Um, I'm glad now that I know there's a spot there. Sandy, so thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you, dear. And, uh, see you at church Sunday. Okay, bye, hon. Okay, hit the button again. Sure. Yeah, yeah, she uh, Sandy's correct. The uh, um, there are people because it, there's there's you know there's different ways to get to get that basically the monkey mm -hmm. off your back. Mm -hmm. And I do know of people that are have uh, achieved sobriety just just through um, spiritual means. Mm -hmm. But I also equally know I know of a guy. And this is super sad, but he was had been in uh, a twelve step program for a few years, like a, quite a few years, like fifteen or something, and figured because of his spiritual connection with God mm -hmm. that it would be okay to start he was Catholic to start drinking the wine on Sundays. Hmm. He was like dead within six months and yeah, six months. Boom, dead. So it just hooked him and pulled him in. Huh? Well, the thing, the way I like to describe it, and it's it's really obvious with heroin. It's a little bit less obvious with alcohol. I believe that the disease is almost as more spiritual than it is anything else. And it's as if the devil has you by the throat and he wants to kill you. And every time you turn away, it's like... It's like a it's like a giant magnet, mm -hmm. okay, and it pulls you in and is trying to kill you and suffocate you, and if you can one day at a time move away from that magnet, the force that it has on you is is becomes less and less one day at a time, and if you have like God over here and you're looking to God and looking to people that are you know like uh, in twelve step program or in in uh, uh, in his program, you focus on that, and you can one day at a time get further and further away from that magnetic pull. But at any moment in time, if you turn back, there there are cases of people that have been sober 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And I have actually a great grandfather that did that. He was sober a long time. And uh, I, um, he started drinking and blew his brains out the, like the next day. It just it it takes you down so quickly. It's mm -hmm. dark. It's very very dark. That's why I look at it as a very spiritual thing. That's why when people don't involve themselves in the spiritual part of it, they're getting half the solution. I remember you brought, made me think of a time when I was in high school and we had an assembly and somebody came and spoke. I don't know if this mem this person was a member of any 12-step program or not, but I kind of goofed off during the majority of it. But during the question and answer part, somebody asked him what it would be like to, if he took a drink then or, or today at that time. And clearly, I remember he said it would be like jumping off a 10-story building trying to stop at the ninth floor. And that's what basically what you're saying yeah. is unless we do something or we, I talk about the clients at the at the lake house because that's my job is to promote um, but when unless something is done to change the person that comes in the chances of relapse again are, are extremely high yeah and it's like you say with your great-grandfather unfortunately the end result is more often than not uh, very very painful yeah, it is. It's it's it. There's actually it actually correlates to the Bible. Is a passage in the Bible, and I can't. I'm not good enough to remember the exact uh, quote, but it in effect says, you know, it is it is better that if somebody never learned about God, than learns about God and then turns away, mm -hmm. because it would be it would be better. The, the, the dog it talks about the dog returning to the vomit. It just basically says that it, he, they would have been a lot better off if they had never been involved at all, mm -hmm. because it will it will the, the relapse will be d devastating. Exactly, and that's and, and that's the that's what they find out in Alcoholics Anonymous. The people that relapse, it's it's weird. It's like 
Uh, somebody described it as the disease is like a ravenous wolf out in the parking lot doing push-ups, waiting for you to screw up. Mm -hmm. And when a alcoholic, if they've been so uh, sober for say ten years, and then they go back out, their disease will have progressed as if they had never stopped. Mm -hmm. So if you picture thirty years then that person, when they start back up again within a very short order, they'll end up dying from alcoholism really, really quickly because mm -hmm. it will be as if they had been drinking for that 30 years. It's not like they're starting from ground zero. They're mm -hmm. starting from where they would have been, mm -hmm. which is really, really bizarre because it doesn't make, it doesn't make uh, physical sense, but it makes absolute spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? It it, it kind of does, but what I'm getting from this, and especially the feedback that you're giving, um, and the family oriented oriented mm -hmm. approach, and also the spirituality being a central component to this this change, this fundamental change, is that you got to start right at the at the ground floor level, the sub basement level, and rebuilding a person's approach to life, mm -hmm. um, their their worldview. Mm -hmm. Their view of themselves in the world, mm -hmm. certainly their view of themselves in their family, mm -hmm. and also working with a family to help renovate that outlook too. Because this person, uh, yeah, they may have been pro proactive in participating in the disease, but it's still a disease, and there's still something of a victim. Mm. Uh, to a certain here. yes, um, an element, yes, but doesn't necessarily mean that the person is the victim. Yeah, sure. And that's where um, a lot of people from looking out to in to the disease thinks that are I kind of lost my train of thought I just wanted to I listened to what you were saying I just want to make sure that I ain't touch on all the subjects I guess the main point is that you got to start at the beginning exactly you go back to the beginning mm -hmm. and be willing to go back to the beginning yes and not think you're so doggone smart or so well, advanced if you, that if, you can't go back to the beginning well if you actually because this is a 12-step program if you go to the through the 12 steps um the first one is basically admitting you're powerless and any yep. alcoholic that has had a, gotten so drunk and dro driven their car in a blackout gets caught and then goes out two weeks later you know and gets drunk and drives a car and gets caught it gets it becomes almost ridiculous not to acknowledge that you're powerless because no moron does that even a moron doesn't do that I should say um, and then as they go through the steps step four and five they start uh, doing like an inventory which is what you're talking they go back to ground sure. and say, what's going on what's going on inside this human being that I react to things the way I react, and 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 step five is confessing all that to uh, a sponsor or somebody like that or a priest. Right. And then later on, step seven, eight, and nine, it's about you reach out to other people too. Mm. It's about thinking. Well, not yet. Step seven, eight, and nine, it's is about um, uh, going through your what you did when you're drinking and making amends to those people you harmed like your family typically to mm -hmm. yourself and then eight nine and ten is about once you're you're starting to get some sort of spiritual growth is starting to you know go help other people right and if you look at alcoholics anonymous i don't think people have an appreciation of what an amazing group of people mm -hmm. what a freaking amazing group of people you can go into an alcoholics anonymous meeting and find somebody that will give you rides to meetings, that will help you out. Will, sometimes they'll help you find a job. All kinds of things. People are willing to bend over backwards for other human beings but and, and expect zero in return. If somebody is willing to do the yes, work, yes. and that's what you touched upon, willingness. And that's yeah. a fundamental key because if a person isn't willing to do what needs to be done to change that inner person, that comes in to the the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and like I said I know plenty of people that have um, gone through the program that have stayed there for a long time and are, are still sober mm -hmm. but unless they are willing to admit that they have the problem and are willing to do what needs to be done to change the person then nothing's going to happen 
and it's it's like you say what you're describing about driving into the tree when blind drunk reminds me of the definition of insanity we all know what that is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results but there's the other one knowing something's going to be terrible and doing it anyways and i'm on the air so i didn't want to say Sure. Yeah, <laughs> he's good. but I, I mean, th these are these are fundamental life lessons for everybody that applies beyond addiction. Mm -hmm. True. You know, you want to change outcomes. You got to change up your approach. And if you're getting the same outcome and it's bringing you down, it's it's ruining your life. Well, bro, time to change. Time to put on the brakes. Yeah, right. and, and change it up. It is true. Yeah. And from what I understand about other twelve-step programs beyond Alcoholics Anonymous, there are thousands of them all based upon the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And in the 12 steps, there's only one that admits the word, or says, mentions the word alcohol. And all the rest are more of things about, well, like Gary was touching upon, cleansing or taking care of the old self, getting rid of that, looking at my, per or not my perception, again, I, it's the terminology, looking at the perception of how I look at myself, how I feel about myself over the things that have been done, and then changing that so I don't do it again. But the willingness is the key, and all the 12 steps is, um, the basic 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous has been used as a template through other 12-step programs. Yeah. So the list goes on and on. You know, you were, you were touching on the uh, victimhood of possibly victimhood of the alcoholic, and that and I I was look, thinking about this the other day, and I don't know if they're the victim or the uh, recipient of a great gift, because alcoholics and alcoholics came up with they probably came up with the statistics, but typically are, are above average intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, Profoundly self-centered and arrogant. Okay. Al the addiction to alcohol or drugs is such a um, a uh, what do you albatross around their neck. Mm -hmm. It requires a profound amount of humility to accept that they've tried because most alcoholics will try different things. Okay, mm -hmm. they're drinking whiskey too much. Oh, switch to vodka. Mm -hmm. Or they'll switch to beer, or they'll switch to this. I'll only drink on Sundays. I deserve this drink. There's all kinds of mental uh, gymnastics they do in their head to justify <laughs> the drinking. Yep. It requires a profound amount of humility to say, all right, I've tried everything mm -hmm. myself, and I keep running into the proverbial tree. Mm -hmm. What do I do? And they go to a meeting, and that humility that is required to accept help, to accept that you don't have the answers, and to accept that there is a God that will help you, leads people to God that I don't believe that they would otherwise, if they're that intelligent and arrogant, I don't believe they would ever even come close to God without the disease of alcoholism. And I agree with what you're saying, but just for simplification the word God is used as and uh, from what I understand a a to encapsulate or to mean something other than themselves it doesn't necessarily have to be a God of what people believe in at this point because a lot of people that I've spoken with believe that God turned their back on them that believe that yes they yeah. that that don't believe in God or the God of their childhood. So when I know this, the negative connotation that can be associated with uh, within an alcoholic to the word God. So when you say that, somebody could be listening and say, as soon as I hear that word, just automatically turn off. So right. yeah, oh, I know that. I know that there's the 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 there's the alcoholic who is. Um, and I've met people like that that were like abused by priests, mm -hmm. and because of that abuse, they believe that their 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 connection with God is completely twisted. Mm -hmm. And 
um, that's why when people are first in, in the program, it's, it's typically you, you talk about, you know, a higher power or the God of their understanding mm -hmm. or, or something. As long as they understand that, like you said, as first off, that humility to accept that you are not God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And maybe God for the first short while is, you know, the sponsor or their group of drunks mm -hmm. or you know, uh, something other than themselves. Yeah, but I think if as you witness sobriety in the long term, the people that uh, get close to God are the ones who end up with serenity and peace of mind and things like that that mm -hmm. like I, I have met people who have gone through 12-step programs or AA and things like that that are atheists mm -hmm. and they are sober but happy is not one of the words I'd use to describe them. <laughs> yep so but, but they got there they made it sober and they're sustaining it which means that it's very clever and it's also very productive to take the semantic baggage of the word God out of the equation, yes. if necessary, depending on who you're dealing with, yeah, and go to higher power, like you said, yeah. or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. As long as they can disassociate themselves and the problems they're having from a resource that could help them get out of it. Exactly. Right. Yeah, there, there was, in uh, the founding of uh, AA, there was uh, early on, there was an atheist who got involved, and he was really bothered because if you look at the original uh, group of people. It was basically a very Protestant, or at least Christian, uh, uh, group. And he said, "Wait a second. There's a lot of people who might be Buddhists. They might be this. So that, that's when they kind of said, okay, what we really care about is getting people sober.' Sure. So they kind of backed off on some of the stuff and started talking about higher power and things like that. So that people yeah. who didn't really believe, or like I, I told about the the guy who was abused, uh, if they have that that mental barrier mm -hmm. you can work around it until they're sp get spiritually stronger or healthier mm -hmm. but yeah that's why that's why they do that it's a huge obstacle i mean there's a lot of people with 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 gripes about what organized religion may have yeah, brought yeah, into yeah. their lives and that's legit and that's a part of their recovery process yes i'm guessing yes. It is. So navigating that is tough. It is. Um, because somebody's perceptions can sway the road that they decide to take in recovery, whether they choose to go back to their, their old habits and behavior or choose to relinquish the, the thought of that maybe this time it'll be different and continue going along the right path. And working with the facility that I do, it's I've seen a lot. Um, and I, like I said, I know quite a few people that are in recovery. I have quite a few friends of mine, very close friends of mine, sure. have gone and stayed many, many years. And other people have gone, and unfortunately, they're no longer here. And it's it's sad that alcoholism is an equal opportunity killer. It doesn't matter right. whether a person is. Um, prominent in society or sleeping on the park bench. I'm curious, what's the, what are the ratios of uh, people that are primarily um, contending with alcoholism specifically versus those that are dealing with narcotics or, or something else that come to your facility? More now of narcotics. We have had alcoholics but nowadays, it's hard to determine or hard to distinguish because the the younger age bracket, unfortunately, um, late 20s, early 30s, dual addicted, uh, alcohol sure. and narcotics. Um, to find a person that is drinking and has never done drugs, it's not that easy. And the other way around, somebody that's doing drugs that's never had a drink, and I heard it said one time, a drink is a drink, a drug is a drug. No matter what happens or how it's ingested, it changes the physical state of the brain to make the person look at things differently and want to crave that more and more. So whatever it is, yeah. it's all part of the, the symptom to the disease. I think it's, it's for normal people, I don't think they understand um, that an opiate or alcohol in the hands of somebody who's addicted is like nirvana. Mm -hmm. It is 
all the anxiety that you might like. Let, let's go back to this this guy who was abused by by a priest. Mm -hmm. All that anxiety that he felt growing up because of the abuse. As soon as he started drinking, that goes away. Mm -hmm. All that all that tension, that that fear. He starts drinking, the fear's gone. And so instead of looking at alcoholics like they're, um, or drug addicts as if they are, uh, lack self-control, mm -hmm. just look at it, they're sick people that are self-medicating. Because that's, in a, in a lot of cases, that's what they're doing. Oh, mm -hmm. self-anesthesia. Self-anesthesia. Exactly. No and they, they don't have a solution. They don't ha understand and so they medicate themselves just to, you know, to, to shut down the voices, so to speak. I heard a comedian one time say a long time ago, um, the reason why he drank was for crowd control. And <laughs> crowd, what control? crowd control. control. <laughs> <laughs> and being as I know, uh, I am aware of the program, I asked him when he was on break, I said, are, are you a member of AA? And he goes, yep. So, <laughs> so I can understand that. The voices inside my head sometimes tell me to do the things that I'm not supposed to do, like have a chocolate chip cookie or a package. And I know that if I'm on not trying to have sweets and I still go ahead and do it, it's like an alcoholic. Picking up that drink, knowing they're not supposed to do it, and then once that drink hits, it's all bets are off. The, the, that's when the compulsion and the obsession turn into the physical craving. So the goal is to change the thinking so that the the thought doesn't turn into a a, com a craving into a compulsion into an action. Right. So that's. But yeah, I agree. Well, that's some deep reconstruction people have to undergo. You yes. got to be brave. Yes. You got to mean it. It's not easy, and it's. Um, it's a lifelong process, but it is, as Gary was saying a moment ago, one day at a time. It has to be because I know, just like anything, again, I'll relate it to going on a diet. For me, I'm, I'm a few extra pounds. If, if I look at it like I'm going to be eating salad for the rest of my life, I won't want a salad now. But if I say that okay, for this one meal, I'm going to have a salad, or just this one day an alcoholic says, I'm not going to have a drink for one day, then those days add up and add up and add up. And that's where the, the learning process has to begin with just one day. Yeah, there's a, uh, a saying that, the, uh, that Alcoholics Anonymous is not for people who need it. It's not for people who want it. It's for those people who do it. Like you're talking about, it's a dedication and a deliberate effort right. to follow what you're suggested, what's suggested to you when you enter the program. And if people who follow those suggestions, they're the ones who actually achieve it. The mm -hmm. ones who go there because they're, you know, their parents said, hey, you're drinking too much or they're doing too, drugs too much, go in there and sit in the back of the room or the, the, the courts. courts tell them to come there yeah. and have their paper signed. It's compulsory. It's yeah. co when they're com compelled to go there because they have to, and they sit in the back of the room, and then they uh, they leave when it's over, and they say, yep, I did it. Well, I don't know what the numbers are for those that are in that scenario and end up with sustainable recovery, but I'll bet they're not nearly as good as those that go on their own. Correct. Yeah, and so. there's really no statistical backing for either one of those groups because it is an anonymous program. Yeah. We don't take surveys. Or again, we um, sure. surveys are not taken. Sure. So. Yeah, it's hard to take surveys of everybody's by their first name. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually one of the problems they have with, uh, and one of the problems I have as a legislator is statistics. Mm-hmm. You know, um, some of the recovery places will say that they are, uh, they have. 40% success rate, just saying, you know, and I'll say, well, you're, you're, I know they're full of garbage, okay? But they'll say, well, how do you, how do you figure that out? Well, after a year, we called the clients and, see, and asked them if they were doing any drinking or drugging. 
So you call up a drug addict and say, you doing any drugs? Nope. 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 Not me. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> but there's no, there's no re reliable statistics to find out which program is, is being more or less successful. And it's very, very difficult. I mean, as a legislator, I would love that information. I mean, if I if some some outside sort uh, resource like UNH did a study to find out that Farnham Center was at ten percent, your facility was at uh, forty percent, and this facility is at thirty percent, we could say, okay, well, Farnham Center is not getting any more money until they change the way they're doing it because it's not working. Mm -hmm. You know, and this guy, well, we're going to give them more money because they're whatever they're doing, make it bigger. You know that kind of thing. I mean, and that, that's I believe that would help a lot, but it's probably also the reason they're not doing it. And not to signal, uh, single out the Farnham Center because they were a fabulous facility. No, I'm not. Facility. I'm not. I'm just. That's because a name that I know. <laughs> of. Okay, I just don't want to have any calls from the Farnham Center no. saying you're in deep doo doo. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> no, just by way of example. Yeah. And I'm sure they shared a lot of the same philosophies, if not nearly all of them. Mm-hmm. Because uh, no, they're they're they have a, a different philosophy. It's less God based, or so, at least it was a while ago. It was. Uh, three principles they don't use the 12 steps okay and i'm not sure what the three principles are i know i know i was i was it was explained to me but it went in one ear and out the other because it didn't make it it didn't but the goal click. set the goal set is comparable which is getting getting you i know the term clean isn't used as much these days um, clean and sober yeah getting you getting you clean and sober and teaching you to let or helping you apprehend the life skills mm -hmm. to sustain that and to find joy Mm -hmm. I, I do know that the most successful sure they're, they're that way too. organizations are <coughs> ones like how how many day programs yours typically ninety days ninety days is a lot better the the ones that go for one month and say and kick you out and say good luck yeah it's a waste of money yeah. I've known a few case studies where or cases rather that that support what you just said yeah mm -hmm. now the ones that go for stick. for ninety days are a lot better. As long as they're follow up, like if you went through 90 days of his program, and then you went to like hope for recovery, or or people kept an eye on you to say, oh, you're still going to meetings, four meetings a week, X number of meetings, or whatever it is, and there's follow up, and you keep, can keep track of somebody for about a year, and they're still staying clean and sober after a year, that's successful. Yeah. I mean, five. It's actually about. I forget what the number is. If, if somebody stays sober for five years, they're probably going to stay that way for a long, long mm -hmm. time. You know, the they, relapse after that point is pretty rare. They've changed their approach to living. Yeah. They've because, changed their place in the world. Yeah, they're basic, like you said, they've gone back, they've reconstructed themselves and look at mm -hmm. themselves completely differently and life completely differently. And they're, they're, um, you know, you're not going to find them, uh, you know, sitting in, a, sitting in a bar drinking Coke, pretending that it's sure. okay, you know? Yeah. Because it was, you know, it's like a, because a lot of people do that. They get out and they say, well, I still want to hang out with my friends. Mm -hmm. So they go to the bar or wherever it is, and they'll say, well, you can't make, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you know, if that horse stays there long enough, he's probably going to get thirsty. Exactly. You know, and 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 it's like that. It's it's part. It's not only friends. It's like you say, the family. I've known people that try to get sober, and they, they're living with a spouse that's drinking or drugging. That's brutal. That is very difficult. That is just brutal because you. And it it all goes back to the perception because the people, of the the family of the alcoholic or the addict generally doesn't understand the disease of addiction. It goes back to what we were speaking about earlier. Sure. It's willpower. You can't put down the drink for me. You want to continue drinking, and they're not changing, or the family isn't changing the environment. There's no support and all that. So it goes... Also, attitudes. Yes. Attitudes, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's right in your... It's on your About Me page on your website mm -hmm. that says a lot of great things, and I referenced it earlier. I think Mark wrote it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. One point that he does make is very, very targeted. It sums everything up. I've opened this recovery home to help your addicted loved one embrace the 12 steps, find his higher power, his or her higher power, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. and facilitate the healing of your family. 
Yes. Which is just what we're touching on here. Yes. You want that support network, that circle, then everybody's got to everybody's got to belly up and take a hard look at how they view what this family member is suffering from mm -hmm. and why they're doing this stuff. Exactly. So there's changes being made all around. It there there has to be. Yeah. Because if one person is is changing and the other people that are involved that are closely knit and they're not embracing even the ide ideology of change, then it's very, very difficult for the person that is trying to change. What do you do in your situation as counselors and as facilitators when you don't have a cooperative family, or at least an important part of the family just has a is stubborn, they don't want to see it? That's a very difficult question to answer because I really don't have any interaction for with the families. That uh, Mark Hatfield, the founder of the home, is very, very involved in the families. Right. Unfortunately, he would he's not here to answer that question, so okay. I I don't even want to hazard a guess. Okay. Yeah, because you can't force people into helping somebody with their recovery. It's like you can't force somebody to recover. It's sure. which is sad, but yeah, because mm -hmm. I know that uh, for uh, alcoholics it's kind of it's kind of sad but funny is that they will start in into sobriety and start their recovery and start you know working on the 12 steps and you'll see uh, within within a year you'll see almost a night and day change in that human being right but their their wife or spouse they're still they're still they're still walking on eggshells mm-hmm you know, because that alcoholic has conned them. I mean, most alcoholics, if you t look at the typical male alcoholic, has probably convinced his wife that he drinks because uh, she's X. Because yeah, she's a handful and he needs well, to, Yeah, and I need I, to I, escape. And, right, and right. And so, so, so by the time and, he, yes. get, he gets recovered and all of a sudden she's, you know, still distant and things like that. It's 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 not easy. It's hard. The family part of the equation is exactly. difficult. Exactly. That's why they call it a process. I mean, yeah. you're, you're rebuilding bridges. Exactly. <laughs> you're rebuilding families too. It takes time. Yeah. And that's why the Al-Anon program is extremely important. I'm not promoting Al-Anon, but again, they have the same 12 steps. But the Al person that's a member of Al-Anon. Al has to understand that they're not responsible for the alcoholic's behavior. They didn't cause it, they can't cure it, and they can't fix it. The alcoholic has to do that. But being so closely intertwined with the alcoholic's actions, somebody doesn't understand that. They think as repetition, it's all your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. So they begin to believe that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen, the change doesn't happen overnight. So if the alcoholic is doing something to change that and the person that is intertwined with the alcoholic doesn't do the changing or isn't aware, then there's it, it can pr be problem problematic. Yeah. That's the word. It's like trying to say that word. Five times fast. Yeah. It's wonderful that organizations like uh, Al-Anon manifested themselves because it probably became clear very early on mm -hmm. as this program evolved that that was a necessary component and you really couldn't ignore those people closest mm -hmm. to the to Yeah, because the they're usually pretty damaged by the time it gets, if By the time somebody's alcoholism gets to the point where they have to deal with it or right. die, basically, they've done some pretty severe damage to those that, that they love. And it's yeah. the same thing with these kids that are drug, you know, drug addicts. How much, how much stuff do they steal mm -hmm. from their family and stuff like that? It's, it's, it's really, really difficult. And I'm glad you guys are doing that. Now we only have, like, we got to close up. Tell people how they can get in touch with uh, uh, your facility. Well, we're on the web at LakeHouseRecovery.com. We're located in Francistown, and uh, I have to apologize because I don't have the number memorized in my head because of. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, too fast for me. Yeah, I know. Good. Six zero three two four seven zero eight hundred is the way to contact us at Lake House Recovery. Yeah, and twelve step program. If you've got a loved one that needs help, that is the way to go. You know. Um, sure are. There's there's one last thing that's on that website that I wanted to put out there, and it's just it's just a word of encouragement. And the phrase is this: There's always hope. Never give up that hope. We do recover. 
and that resonated with me. I just thought I'd share that too. Thank Eric. you. Thanks for showing up, buddy. You're all right. 50% <laughs> of the deal. Jim, thank, thank you very you, much. Yeah. We'll uh, see you guys next week. Good to see you, sir. Good to see it's you been as a pleasure. Well.